this afternoon. Uh, hello, everybody. So I am not sure if you saw the YouTube video and you, you could hear the music. This was Christoph Sietzen, an Austrian percussionist uh, playing the marimba. So there is a group of, of young uh, modern musicians and composers. Uh, maybe you know Martin Grubinger, who is as Christoph Sietzen, professor of uh, composition and music at the university, Musical University of Vienna. And they play a lot of percussion stuff and uh, quite interesting. Okay, so today we will compute explicitly the phylogenetic trees of strings in our orbit spaces. And uh, I want to add a small correction to what I did last time and also some complementary material because there was some confusion about the orderings and the uniqueness and injectivity and permutations. So let me, let me revise briefly where we are. So the setting, I hope you hear me and you see me. Otherwise, please complain. So we have n in n, and that it will be the interesting case is at least four. Uh, even three could be possible, but OK. And we said capital N, the set, we call it the set of labels. I have to watch out not to lose my mouse. Just a second, I'm, I'm back again. OK, the set of labels. And this are all the indices. And uh, n over 3, these are the triples, t, i, j, k. I already sent you an email explaining this, what I'm repeating now. but. For completeness, let me do it also here. The triples, so they are i, j, they are increasingly ordered. That's just bookkeeping, ordered. And this set, which I denote n true 3, capital N true 3, that itself is ordered, uh, equipped with some ordering. So we, we could take the, le typically the lex lexicographic if we want. It doesn't matter which one we take. So we obtain P1 will be the projective line. And then this, here the elements are n tuples, which we also call n gons. And uh, we are not allowed to permute. Yeah? So the action PGL2 acts on P1n components wise, but no permutations of the entries. Permutations of entries. And what are the entries here? with entries xi. Okay. So then we still take a larger space. We take p1 n n to 3, which is, of course, p1 n times n to 3. And here the elements will be called strings. of n gons. So some people in the audience like to call it big vector. Okay. So <clears throat> and it will consist of n gons xt, t in n over three. Okay. And xt will be xt1 up to xtn an n gon of x. Okay. So this we call them strings. 
Now, we inside here, so we are not allowed here to permute the entries of the n-gons of the strings. Okay? So inside here, we will consider a subset which I will denote by Zn, script Zn. And these are x equals xt, t in n over 3. So recall that at the beginning, yeah, at the beginning, we had only n gons with pairwise distinct entries. And then we were allowed to move three of the entries of each xt to special position. So here we assume that xti is 0, xtj is 1, and xtk is infinity if t is ijk. For all, yeah, for all t's it should hold. So that's kind of a special choice of our present representative. Okay. Very good. So we shall mostly work inside here. And of course, the elements, the n-gons here, they always have at least three different entries, because we prescribe three of them as being 0, 1, and infinity. And then we had a un. This was p1 to the n minus the big diagonal. So here we had uh, n-gons. The elements were n-gons. That's the opposite sign here. n-gons with pairwise distinct entries. Okay. And I made a mistake. We have this map sigma n, which is not as I claimed, as I falsely claimed, it is not injective. It is constant on the orbits. And it will be induced an injective map. But this one is just p1 n times n over 3. And how did we do this? We took such an n gon x and we send it to a string x xt t in n over 3. And this string was unique. So this will now belong to this zn. It is unique with xt equivalent to x. So I hope my notation is clear. Whenever I write boldface, I mean a, a string. And whenever I just write x or xt, I mean an n-gon. Okay, so that's a, a unique choice uh, for each t of a representative of x. Okay, so this map is constant on orbits. And of course, it is injective. If you go to the orbit space, so here we go down to m0n, which is un up to pgl2. And then this map now will be really an inclusion. Actually, it goes into zn inside here. And this is now what I denoted by xi of n. This is injective. Okay. And uh, one more notation, what we called V of n was the image under xi of m 0 n. So this is a subset of this p1 to the n n over 3. OK. Any questions so far? Is this approximately clear where we are? I have a problem with my mouse. Excuse me. Uh, that's a problem I cannot solve, but OK. 
here we are. So this is this sigma n, we call it the symmetrization map, or xi of n, symmetrization. And of course, xi of n is well defined. So we need one more thing. We need the set of quadruples. So we can denote it n4, which are q equals ij kl in n4. Now, here we assume that pairwise distinct labels, the i, j, k, l, I call them labels, pairwise distinct labels, but they need not be in increasing order. So there's just an ordered four-tuple, not necessarily increasingly. Of course, the permutations don't play a big role, but nevertheless. And then if z is z1, zn, a vector of variables, so I distinguish points and variables by reserving the letter z for the variables and x's for the points. Then we have the cross ratio with respect to q of z, z1 minus z3, z2 minus z4, z1 minus z4, z2 minus z3. And this will be denoted z1, z2, z3, z4. Sometimes I write commas in between, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, an important remark. We want to understand this. Uh, the first remark is the following, that if you take a, an arbitrary string in Zn, an arbitrary string in in Zn, x equals xt, t in n over 3. So now at the beginning, these are not related to each other, the xt's. So some of them could be equivalent, some could be different. Yeah? We'll define a set of orbits, I, I denote, I always mean PGL2 orbits, which I will denote like this. Okay, So this is a set of orbits of the string, of the string x. It could be, now, if, if we start with a string which comes from an n gone inside, where are we? Inside un, then necessarily these xt will all be equivalent to each other, so we just have one orbit. But in more general cases, we'll have several ones, okay? We will see how many we can have, okay? Now, this is the first remark. A second remark is, that when we go here, from here to here, then, of course, as we are pairwise distinct, as I just said, these xt will all define the same orbit, but also they will have the same cross ratios. So if, uh, if x 
is sigma n of x, x in u n, then all x t define the same orbit and will have the same cross ratios for all q in n4. So cross qxs will be cross qxt, obviously. So now we are going to enlarge this image here. We want to compactify it. So this is not closed here, not closed, topologically not closed. So we can take two different objects. The first one is we can take the closure xn. So this will be Vn projective closure topological closure or the risky closure inside this projective space. Okay. We don't really know how it looks like, but it adds something to our Vn. Okay. This is one option. And the other option is the following. As we go to a boundary point here, so Bn will be xn minus Vn, the boundary. As the cross ratio is continuous, the elements inside here, the strings here, will again satisfy this property. Satisfy star. Same cross ratios. I already mentioned this uh, another time. So we could, instead of looking just at this closure, we could define y of n as, now we take the strings in Zn, recall Zn are strings where we have normalized xt to be at 0, 1, and infinity at certain places. We take those x where the cross ratio of xt with respect to q equals the cross ratio. Can you read here? I hope it goes. Q xs. And this for all s t and for all q quadruples. Okay. So this is certainly closed. It deserves a, a comment because if if we take a cross ratio here, and if you plug in points in P1 for the Z1, Z2, and so on, then this cross ratio is not defined whenever three of these entries here are equal. If you take variables, this will not happen. But if you substitute the variables by points in P1, then if three are equal, the cross ratio is not defined. So here, as we have now xt and xs uh, n-gons in p1 to the n. Well, they are here. Because of this, yeah, it could be that when you take your quadruple q, that precisely the four entries you choose here in xt have three which are equal. And then this cross ratio is not defined, or maybe this cross ratio is not defined, or both are not defined. In this case, in the definition of yn, we delete this equation. Actually, 
If you work it out, it will be an equation 0 equals 0, so you don't need it. Okay? So here, please add whenever defined. Uh, I'm running out of space. I have to, to erase in a minute. So I repeat, here we take a, this is a closed subset of p1 n to the n times 3, imposing equality of cross ratios. And by our construction, we see that xn will be contained in yn. I have to write this down. I repeat, we have seen that by continuity, the cross ratios hold to this one. Xn is contained in yn. I think I can, you remember this picture here, so I can uh, clean the blackboard, or the light board. So you see there's a certain amount of organization and bookkeeping, but it's not difficult. And it's not confusing, I hope, because it's very systematic. No? After all, we want to, to understand what we really do. Just a second. I don't hear well if I, while I'm cleaning. So sorry, yes, please, Paul, you wanted to ask something? Uh, yes, um, this has Vn that we defined. Um, you mentioned that it's now closed. Um, I was wondering, is it open? Be um, because uh, or it doesn't have boundary points that we don't care about? Uh, it's not, I mean, inside Zn, inside Zn, it's neither open. No, no, no. It is, it is a, if it would be open, the closure would be everything, but xn is much smaller. xn will have a dimension n minus 3. Yeah? xn is, will be our moduli space, and it has, after, after inspection, we have to prove this, uh, it has dimension n minus 3, and we are in a much larger projective space. So remark D is clear that xn is contained in yn. Now, xn will be, after all, our compactification. So uh, one part of the theorem, theorem later, but this needs quite a bit of time to prove it, precisely what you expect, xn is yn. OK, so we have two descriptions of the closure. Now, this implies, for instance, the following. Uh, xn as the risky closure of vn, it is irreducible as an algebraic variety. Irreducible? That's easy to say because vn is irreducible. So uh, by this equality, we prove automatically that our compactification will be irreducible, which is a theorem of Delin and Mumford. Of course, they do not just uh, curves of genus 0, they do G curves of any genus. But in the case of rational curves, B, genus 0, this will reprove that this is irreducible. Okay? So we will work, at the beginning, we will work with both, mostly with Yn. And I hope that in general, we will be able to prove here the equality. We tried to prove it directly just from scratch, but we did not succeed. It's not so easy. Or at least it does not seem that it is so easy. Okay. What I want to do now, uh, so this is, so maybe remark E, uh, much later, maybe we have to continue in, maybe I should write March later. Maybe we have to continue in March. Much later, we will show that xn is isomorphic to m0n bar, which is the Delin Mumford Knudsen compactification. 
So already the definition of this compactification is quite complicated in the original articles. And here, we didn't do a lot. Uh, we just defined this symmetrization map, and we took a Zariski closure. Okay? So that's a quite elementary interpretation of this compactification. But not only this, it gives us a lot of information by using phylogenetic trees. And that's the next thing I want to explain you. So uh, this is now the construction of phylogenetic trees for, of strings in, let me do it in yn. So we will just assume, so this yn will lie in z, and so recall the strings here, they consist of xt's. The xt's had a, had a three entries at preferred locations, 0, 1, and infinity. And all the cross ratios are the same, so this equality which we have here. OK? So, uh, I already indicated a little bit how this works. So let x equal xt t in n over 3 to be in yn such a string. Then we want to define a graph. Define a graph, a gamma of x as follows. We will do it stepwise. So first we define vertices. And these vertices, they are what I call inner vertices. And they are just given by the orbits defined by the n-gons of x. Okay, so if we, if we have the generic string corresponding to a point to an n-gon in un, then we just have one inner vertex. Okay, so maybe I draw this. This would be if x corresponds to x, and this is in un, I call this the generic string. Then we just have one orbit or one vertex. And then we will have leaves. And these could be called the outer vertices. And these are just i, the i in n. So it goes from 1 to n. That's not much of information. OK. Uh, and now to, to define the edges and the connections between these, we do the following. So we do the following trick. If xt in p1n is an n-gon, let us collect in groups the indices, and I repeat, which are the labels of xt, where xti coincide. Okay, so this will give us uh, a partition. I call it the incidence set, incidence sets of xt will be partitions, set partitions 
of our label set N, I1 T, this joint I2 T, and so on, I K T. And of course, none of these sets are empty, and they are disjoint. So let me just take xt equals 0, 1, infinity, infinity, a, 1, 0, 0. So here we have n equals 8. And we will have 1, 7, 8, 2, and 6, 3, and 4, and 5. Of course, I assume that a is different from 0, 1, and infinity. OK? So now, one thing which is clear, that now we will have repetitions. We allow repetitions of entries. We discussed this at length in the, in the class about limits. But what is clear is if xt is equivalent to xs, which means that they have the same orbit, then, so let me, this partition, I will denote it by script it. Okay. So script it will be a collection of subsets of n disjoint unit. Okay. So now, if these are equivalent, then the PGL2 orbit cannot separate equal entries. They must remain under the PGL direction equal. And of course, it cannot either glue or coalesce to different entries. So this implies that the partition sets IT will be the same as the one for S. Okay. I hope this is clear. Now, here we have uh, one of these. In this example, we just have one label which comes alone. Yeah? So this, we call it a singleton of xt. So I did this definition just for one n gon. But of course, whenever we have a whole string as here, we get for each xt, we will get such a partition. Such a partition. So we get a collection of partitions. Yeah. We will do it for n equals 5 in a minute. So I ask you a little bit of patience. I want to define everything properly so that we have it <coughs> on board. Are there any further questions so far? I hope you, you see a little bit where we are going. So this will be a singleton of xt, but I could also call it, or as it only depends on the orbit, or of xt, like this. Okay. So <clears throat> if we take now our vertices, which correspond to the orbits, we draw them in blue. So this will be one of these vertices. So I'm going to construct p, uh, stepwise our phylogenetic tree. So what we do is the following. Uh, there might be many singletons or just a few. We draw edges. I don't know how to call them. Maybe I just call them 1, 2, 3. These here will be the singletons 
of b or of xt. And then we do the following. So in this example, we would just have one singleton. Yeah. The next thing we do is we draw edges going out of v for each of these incident sets. So here we have three. So my picture does not completely correspond, but well, maybe I should. That's not very good, because you will get confused. Let me do it more accurately. Sorry. Let's try to do it in this example. So we have v equals xt. And we just have one singleton. And I draw it like this, and I call it 5. Okay. And then we will draw an edge for each of these larger incidence sets. So here we have 1, 2, 3 such sets. And then we want to equip these three edges with 1, 7, 8, 2, 6, and so on. But there will be also other vertices. So I don't know yet how to do it, but I will indicate it by dotted lines. So here we would have maybe 1, 7, 8, somewhere out here. Here we will have, maybe we continue with our blue edges, but then at the end we want to have outside here 2 and 6. And here we want to have 3 and 4. And this can be done, this kind of graphic can be done for all vertices. Do this for all vertices v equals xt of a string x and y. And we don't need the cross ratios at the moment. We will need them later. Okay. So that's the first thing we do. Now, if we have two vertices, we are not, it's not clear whether we should connect them or not. Yeah? So here we expect to have a vertex. Here a next vertex. Maybe we have several ones. But we don't know what the edges should be good for. So in order to understand this, let us do the case n equals 5. Yeah? One thing we know. Uh, and before we go to n equals 5 is something. So as we are in Zn, here we are inside this Zn, I already said that each n-gon will have at least three different entries. Okay? So as it has three different entries, each vertex will have at least three edges yeah, uh, emanating from it. So each inner vertex will have degree, and the degree is the number of edges. And I count the blue and the yellow edges here, yeah? blue plus yellow, at least 3. And that's part of the definition of a phylogenetic tree. OK. So uh, to understand the edges, let us do the example, the case n equals 5. And that's already quite interesting, and I hope a lot of fun. So we have x in yn. The generic string which means x is actually in Vn. Then as I said before, we have V equals xt, just one vertex. And all entries are distinct, so we will have 
five leaves, one, two, three, four, five. We have five singletons, and that's what we could call the generic tree. It doesn't look like generic, but let us call it a generic tree. So that's the, the generic case. Now we have to do the non-generic case. So uh, maybe you tried it at home to do this case. It's not so complicated. And it will uh, tell us how to define the graph. So I am aware that there's always some overlap with earlier classes, but that's a little bit on purpose because the subject, the techniques are kind of new, and maybe you are not so familiar with it, or you may forget how it works. So for the non-generic strings, x in y n minus v of n, non-generic. So what can happen? We had three cases. There was a small error last time referring to these three cases, but I hope you could fix it yourself. It was not very. So the first one would be precisely, precisely. So now we will have equal entries. So three cases for xt and n gone of x. Precisely two equal entries. Second, precisely two pairs of equal entries. And third, precisely three equal entries. So this means we have three singletons. Here we have one singleton, one singleton, and here we have two singletons. So now, how many orbits could we have? So that's not so clear. Yeah. Uh, so we have x equals xt, t in n over 3. Now this n over 3, we will have, I think, 10 case, no less. Uh, and I write xt equals xt1, xt2, xt3, xt4. There is some writing, but we cannot avoid it. This will be in p1 to the power 5. Okay. So now we have to distinguish uh, these cases. Case i. <clears throat> so we have two equal entries. I will write it. Uh, I will take, without loss of generality, we take t equals 1, 2, 3 to simplify our life. And we write xt as 0, 1, infinity, a, a. And a is distinct from 0, 1, infinity. So now we are in yn. So if we take xs, if xs is another 5 gone of x, what happens? So as we are in yn, it must have equal cross ratios. It must have equal cross ratios. Of course, if 
xs is equivalent, pgl2 equivalent to xt, that's not interesting. We want it to have a different orbit. Okay. Let me write it down, cos xs q equals cos qxt for all q in n up 4. Okay. Now we have to do a little bit of case distinction, but we, I will just take one q, eg, take q equal, we take 2, 3, 4, 5. Just to illustrate what's happening. So this implies if we look here in this one, the last two are equal for among these four. So this implies then that's an easy computation. The cross ratio of xt will be 1, yeah? meaning last two entries are equal. Now, two things can happen. Uh, two cases. A. So as this cross ratio is a special value, uh, I recall that 0, 1, and infinity are the special values corresponding to the equality of entries. Uh, uh, two cases can occur. A, xs has, I think I started, the same incidence partition as xt. And we want to figure out how xs must look like. Okay. So I claim, in this case, xs is already equivalent to xt. And why? Let us prove this. So we take again, we choose q suitably, q1, 2, 3, k, I think. k could be 4 or 5, k, 4 or 5. And we take t was 1, 2, 3, as before. So this implies. Hold on. Yes. So as xs has the same incident partition as xt, we see that in xs no three entries are equal. Note no three entries of xs are equal. Hence, the cross ratio is defined. And this must be equal to the cross ratio of xt are both defined. So we really do have this equation, are both defined. Recall. The cross ratio is not defined if three of the respective entries are equal. Okay. So now we can move as the incident pattern is the same. Take A in PGL2 such that. So what happens here? In this XS, the first three entries will be pairwise distinct. So there exists an a x s equals 0, 1, infinity, and so on. Yeah. By this assumption that the, here the incident partition are the same. But the remaining, the remaining entries here are completely determined by the cross ratios. I discussed this already. And the other entries of xs and also of xt, also of xt, are determined 
by the cross ratios but the cross ratios are equal so this implies hence axs must be equal to xt and therefore xs is equivalent to xt so you see the argument is easy but one has to do it at least once in your life so I think I want to continue a little bit. Maybe we, as this today, it's very easy material. It's just fooling around with these cross ratios and entries. So maybe we don't make a break. So of course, I know already where I want to go. But if you do this the first time, without knowing what is the final, the final objective, then it's not so obvious. So b, b is the interesting case. Now we assume that the incidence pattern is different. b x s has different incident partition, incidence partition different from xt. So there is a lemma, which I'm not going to show, which we will do later on. So incident partition means that just one incident set is at least different. But one can show that then all incident sets are different. All incident sets are different. In particular, in particular, the singletons are also different. In particular, xs and xt do not share a common singleton, which is a little bit surprising, but it is like this. And uh, let me now write xs unknown, c1 up to c5, in p1, 5. And now we have to, we can consider the whole thing up to permutations. Here, uh, if we permute the last two entries, nothing changes. And if you permute the first three, also nothing changes. Yeah, the incidence pattern is the same. So uh, up to permutations of 1, 2, 3, respectively 4, 5 we are left with the following cases. Uh, A. No, A is not good. Uh, maybe 1. S equals 1, 2, 4. And B s equals 1, 2, 5. This uh, covers up to permutations all cases. So this is a 2. Excuse me. So let us do s equals 1, 2, 4. So xs has, xs will look now 0, 1, c3, infinity, c5. I do this in so much detail because it really shows what's going on. You see here the pattern which will hold for any n. Yeah? So now we want to determine c3 and c5. But we know that xs will have the same cross ratios as xt. So we have to choose the right quadruple. So take q, for instance, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
then the respective cross ratios have to be the same. But what does this mean? If we take 4 or 5, the cross ratio here will be 1, because the last two components are 1. So the cross ratio here has to be 1. So being 1, we have this 2, 1 to 4. Let me underline this here. This will be the game we are playing, 1, 2, 4, 5. So the cross ratio is 1 if and only if either the first two are equal or the last two are equal. That's easy to check. But the first two are different. Yeah? So this implies that C5 is infinity. And if we take Q equals 1, 2, 3, 4 by a similar argument, we get that C3 must be 1 minus A. Okay, A was different from 0, 1, and infinity. So hence, we have completely determined Xs. It will be 0, 1, 1 minus A, infinity, and infinity. And by construction, this one will actually be equivalent to xt. So here, nothing new appears. We don't get a new, a new vertex. The second case is s equals 1, 2, 5. The same game, and then we will draw the picture. So now xs will look 0, 1, c3, c4. These are not known yet, and infinity. And we want to determine c3 and c4. Okay. Again, we take q conveniently, and you use that the cross ratios are equal of xt and xs. Now you have to think a little bit what you take, but you take q equals 1, 2, 3, 4. Now what happens? 1, 2, 3, 4. If we look here, these are the first four. These four here and these four here. Is that what I want? Ah, I'm, I'm sorry, there was a misprint. There is a misprint. Excuse me. I was, I was now confused. This is a 4 here. This is a 4 here, so I have to erase this one. Uh, it could not work like this. So xs is 0, c2, c3, 1, and infinity. And we want to determine c2 and c3. If we take 1, 2, 3, 4, I am not happy. I am not happy. Hold on a second. C2 equals C3. One, let me underline it. So maybe you want to help me. Wasn't it easier when last time you used, you just use a formula and then you took the limit and everything and then you... No, no, you know, yes, but I, I don't want to take limits here. Uh, you're right, but it's not so difficult. So uh, we have, sorry, these are just the first four. Uh, ba -ba -ba I want to show that C, let me write it down, C2 equals C3 equals 0 or C2 equals C3 equals 1. So why is this the case? Which means if the first three are equal, the cross ratio is not defined. And if these three are equal, it's also not defined. So I claim that taking this one, they can never be equal to this one. I don't see it at the moment. So let me 
let me leave a question mark here. And then we take q equals 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 5. I'm very sorry. 1, 2, 3, 5. By the same argument, we get c2 equals c3 equals 0, or c2 equals c3 equals infinity. And combining both, we see that c2 and c3 must be 0. So all together, combining this, gives xs is 0, 0, 0, 1, infinity. Maybe, maybe my choice of q's was not the good one. I, I will send it to you by mail. But you can do it yourself, and you will easily find that xs must be this one. And now you observe something. What you observe is that here we have three singletons, 0, 1, uh, one two, 2, and 3. And here we have a pair of siblings, yeah, the indices, the same entries. And here we have precisely the opposite entries, which are equal. Okay? And that's the phenomenon which occurs. So now we can draw, now we can draw our phylogenetic tree. I'm a little bit upset that I took the wrong cues, but it cannot be very difficult. I did it yesterday, and it was OK, but now I don't see it. <coughs> but it's not easy, to, not difficult to show it. So. So here, this xs is, of course, not equivalent to xt. xs not equivalent to xt. And so what is the result? Uh, let me do it in blue. Here we have v equals xt. So maybe I should write again what xt was. xt was 0, 1, infinity, a, a. So it has three singletons, which I draw like this, which correspond to the first three entries, 1, 2, 3. And then we said, that we will have at least one edge going out here, and then 5 and 6 will be on the same road. The first part will be the same. And for w, which is xs, which is another vertex, and actually there are only two, what is the picture here? We have the first, the singletons are 5 and 6. And then we must have uh, an edge. And uh, somewhere going out by this edge, we will have the 3 equal 1, 2, 3. And now you want to add this to get a graph or a tree. And now I think it's clear how you do this. You will have one edge. V, W, and you get one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So this will be gamma of x. Of course, you have to show that we just have two orbits. Two orbits, one edge. Okay. And uh, as you see, 
v and w, v has degree 4, w has degree 3. So this was the case uh, of, this was case i with precisely two equal entries. Now I want to do also case, the next one, where we have precisely two pairs of equal entries. I will do it a little bit shorter, but just to show what the graph will be. So uh, xt has no choice. xt, which is our preferred one, it must have, let me do it like this. By symmetry, assume the first two and the last two are equal. Okay, and we don't have any other choice because we must have 0, 1, and infinity at some place. And we take t equal, for instance, 1, 3, 5 here. No? 1 is 0, 3 is 1, and 5 is infinity. So what does this mean for our v equals xt? Again, we draw the singletons, but we just have one singleton, which is 3. And uh, we have two more incident sets, namely 1, 2, and 4, 5. So the picture is very simple. 1, 2, 4, 5, or 4, 5. That's what we expect at the vertex v, but we don't know how to continue here. No? There could be more blue edges. And this also works, so there are several t's which give us the same orbit. We could also take 1, 3, 4, or we could take 2, 3, 4, or 2, 3, 5. They all give us just the same orbit. So you have to work through all the triples. Yeah. So let xs be another 5 gun of x. <coughs> and we write it again, xs equals c1, c2, c3, c4, c5. Maybe I should give this as a homework, because it's, when you do it, you will see it's really fun. Now, S cannot be one of these because we want, of course, xs to be non-equivalent to xt. So three up to permutations, which are suppressed, three cases to distinguish. Namely, uh, a s equals 1, 2, 3, b s equals 1, 3, 4, and c s equals 1, 2, 4. Of course, uh, later on we won't do all this uh, in such detail, but uh, at the beginning I think it's worth to do it once. Maybe you can guess, meanwhile, what will be the the graph or the tree, the phylogenetic tree which appears here. So I will do it briefly. A S was 1, 2, 3. So xs will be 0, 1, infinity, c4, c5. And I just indicate what you have to take. You take the quadruple q equals 1, 2, 3, 4. And you get for free from the equality of cross ratios, you get c4 equals infinity. And if you take q equals 1, 2, 3, 5, 
you get the same by symmetry. So <clears throat> you see again that xs will be 0, 1, infinity, infinity, infinity. So this is not equivalent to this one. And it will have complementary incidence set. Here we have 3, 4, 5 with the same. And here we have 1 and 2. So that's the phenomenon we observe. Afterwards, we have to prove that this is always the case. B s equals 1, 3, 4. So xs will be 0, c2, 1, infinity, c5. You take q uh, for completeness. You take again 1, 2, 3, 4. And from the cross ratio, you get c2 equals 0. And if you take q equal 2, 3, 4, 5, you, also, you get c5 equals infinity. So xs will be, in this case, uh, ba -bum, 0, 0, 1, infinity, infinity. And that's equivalent or that's the same as xt. So nothing new. This does not count. You don't get a new. And finally, s equals 1, 2, 4. Then we have xs equals 0, 1, c2, infinity, c5. Something is wrong. This is c3. Again, you take q equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and you get c3 equals infinity. And if you take q equals 1, 2, 3, 5, uh, c5 is infinity. And so xs will be now again 0, 1, infinity, infinity, and infinity. And that's not equivalent to xt. So here we have just one new vertex, but I said up to permutations. Now, now if we permute the whole story, uh, you see here we have these two equal and the last three equal, but we also have these two equal, and then we should get by symmetry, we get xr equal uh, ba -ba -bum, 0, 0, 0, 1, infinity. And this is not equivalent to xt and not equivalent to xs. So now we get three orbits, three orbits. So that's more interesting. And let me draw the picture. So what's the time? Oh, yeah, we still have 15 minutes. <clears throat> so if you say, OK, that's all this is too easy and maybe boring or whatever, then just think of doing the same for n-gons in the plane. And for n gons in the plane, it's not known. So you can try to invent it on your own. What would be the correct graph? And what would be the compactification? So as I already mentioned, this graph, this phylogenetic tree we are drawing, will give us precise information about the strings in our compactification. So now we have, we have three, three orbits. So we have uh, xs, which looks like this. Then we had xt. And now you see a miracle happens. happens. And here we have xr. I draw the singletons. So the singletons here are 1 and 2. And then we have 3, where we don't know what's going on. Then here we just have 1 singleton, 3, 1, 2, Three, four, and here we have the symmetric picture. 
Oh, sorry, four, five, four, five, four, five, one, two, and three. And we want to add or combine these three informations as before to one graph. But now it's clear how the graph looks. Looks like this gives us xs, xt, xr, one, two, three, four, and five. So how do we have to interpret this? We call it the incidence graph. of x. So how do we read this? Let me repeat. xs has, three single, has two singletons, entry 1 and entry 2. And everything which goes out here will be equal. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I started with xt. xt was our first. xt had a singleton at place entry xt3 and 2 equals 1. So going, going to the left, or for you it's to the right, we have 2 equals, and here we have 2 equals. So everything which is after a blue edge will be the same entry for xt. Again, these two will be equal. This is separate, and these two are equal. And for xs, we will have first and second entry are singletons, and all the other three which are at the going out of this edge will be equal. Okay. So that's the incidence graph. So conclusion, this cannot be a coincidence. There must be a rule behind. There must be a general rule behind this pattern valid for all n. And that's what we are going to prove in the next sessions. And how, how did we combine here? From these three pieces of information, our total tree, the observation is so recall in xs and xt, I said it several times uh, for xt, these two entries are equal, and for xs, the other three are equal. So adjacent vertices share complementary incidence sets. OK. Eric, and the, uh, I yeah. think the, the right thing with the, with the green dashed line in the middle should be 1, not 2, right? So 1, 3, 4. Well, there are two fours anyway, so four should be one. So on the right side, after the plus, plus. Here? Yeah, there are two fours there, so one, two, one. one. Is one four? This is a one. I'm um, sorry. Okay. This is a one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I, I yeah. think it's correct, yeah. 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 So I think uh, that's already quite a bit of information. Now you can think about it, how you do it. In the general case, you can do the, try to do the case n equals 6. But you can also do the opposite. And I will conclude with this. For n equals 6, you, do, you start with such trees, and then you look for the strings. Okay. So what are the possible, what are the possible uh, trees we can draw? 
So the generic one will have just one. Then we will have those with one edge, with two edges. And then we have the interesting one, which is this one. So here you have four orbits. Okay. So I recall, so x will now be in p1, 4, 4 over 3. Okay. Now we have six labels to distribute. In the generic case, we have, no, that's too much. That's 7. Sorry. That's the generic case. Then here we distribute maybe 4 here and 2 here. We need at least 2. And then we can have 3 and 3. Huh? I recall we require that each blue vertex always has its three adjacent leaves or inner vertices. Now here. We have our candidate from before, but we have one label more, so we could have this one, but we could also have this one. Okay. And the last one, the inner vertex in the middle here, he has already it has already three edges, so it doesn't need a leaf. And we get this one. So these are all phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees with six leaves. Okay, up to numeration of the leaves. Now <laughs> you can do the you can do the strings inside here and try to construct in a similar pattern as before the incidence graph and then you will detect that the incidence graph of any string inside here of course we are sorry we are actually we are in this zn no? the incidence graph is always one of these here that's life so there must be, it must be like this always. But even more, it's the opposite also holds. Whenever you choose one phylogenetic tree here, you will find a string here which has this incidence graph. Okay? So all phylogenetic trees appear through the incidence graphs of strings in Z4. Okay? So that's something we are going to prove. In particular, you see that the blue vertices, they all have different singletons. No one has the same singletons. So that's something you, you can try to prove it on your own. And I tell you in advance, it's tricky. It looks trivial, but it's not, it's not very, very hard once you see the proof, but you have to do something. Yeah? So I invite you and I will send you a mail where I will specify this to try to do the case n equals 6 at least maybe to find the string which has this incidence graph. Yeah. Actually, I asked Jose to program this. I'm not sure if it is really possible to program it, but this would be, of course, the best thing. So we have a bijection between phylogenetic trees with n leaves and incidence graphs of strings inside here, taking but of course, we used, we used the, the equality of cross ratios. So here, actually, the x, I was mistaken. I should take it, of course, in this set y n defined by the equality of cross ratios. That's the best I can offer. Okay? I hope you like it a little bit. I like it very much because it is, it is very explicit. It is very concrete. But it has a lot of mysteries. Yeah? There are things which are absolutely 
unclear how to prove, even though it's combinatorics. Yeah? And for me, at least, it is a, a new field to do these phylogenetic trees. But the interesting part is, of course, to, to recover geometric information about the compactification from these phylogenetic trees. For instance, we use the phylogenetic trees to prove that our moduli space yn, which is equal to xn, script yn and script xn, that this is smooth. Okay? So if, uh, something which was proven by Knudsen using a huge amount of machinery. Okay? Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we meet hopefully next week. And the, the recording will be probably online on Thursday. Thank you very much and have a wonderful week until next time. Bye-bye.